You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at bbmglobalnetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Both Sides of the Prescription brings together Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron to discuss pertinent medical issues from both an alternative and traditional medicine perspective. So now, please welcome the hosts of Both Sides of the Prescription, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. Welcome, everyone, to Both Sides of the Prescription radio show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. I am your host, Dr. Megan Kirschling, and I am joined tonight by my father, Dr. Ron Kirschling, as we tackle some of the best uh, conversations in the medical world, and we cover them from really talking about both sides, uh, both alternative and traditional medicine. The reason that we've come together is that we actually are both sides of medicine. I have a much more alternative background. I started as a nurse on an organ transplant floor, but since then have moved into more of alternative training, uh, working both as a nurse practitioner and chiropractor in Minnesota. A lot of the patients I see uh, really have a lot of concerns that are functional medicine based. They've seen a lot of other providers and uh, have been told that they might not have a disease diagnosis, but are looking for options and alternatives to help them have better health and wellness. And so in my clinic, I do a lot of different practices and procedures from chiropractic care to even utilizing like low level lasers and then doing a lot of nutritional programs with them. Uh, including, you know, functional medicine, uh, injections, and supplement and nutrition therapy. One of the things that I've realized by working in all these different realms in medicine is that a lot of times we approach a patient by only one side. And a lot of these conversations that we have about different topics and things that are important to people really only take into consideration whatever side you're coming from. I wanted to really incorporate both sides of medicine, have conversations and discussions that looked at both sides. And I thought, who better to have these conversations with than my traditionally trained father, Dr. Ron Kirschling? Well, good evening, Megan. It's good to be here again. And um, a little bit about myself. I am a uh, medical doctor. Uh, I have been in clinical practice now for um, over three decades. My initial training was in internal medicine, and I subspecialized in medical oncology and hematology. Uh, as I said, uh, I've really been clinical-based my whole professional career, and largely with uh, uh, cancer patients. And this is a group of, pa- of uh, patients who oftentimes are faced with uh, life-defining or even life-threatening illnesses. And in that context, um, they're certainly open to what I can offer them as a medical oncologist, uh, but they're also interested in really any therapy that that might help them. So it's not unusual in my daily practice that uh, I will get questions about uh, whether or not what diet people should have, whether there are any kind of complementary therapies that would be helpful or or alternative therapies. As you could tell from Megan's description, um, it has been fun for me as her father to follow her um, her journey through healthcare, from nursing to chiropractic to nutritional chiropractic to back to nurse practitioner first in women's health and then family medicine, and uh, this has allowed me exposure to to ideas that I don't know that I would have uh, been able to pursue or, uh, at the depth that I have been. Some of those, for example, in what Megan mentioned with functional medicine. So uh, 
I share with Megan uh, a feeling that with our patients in mind, that it's very important that we um, collaborate with all care providers. And in that sense, Megan and I feel that the topics that we talk about here are meant to hopefully elicit interest in our in our listeners with the understanding that we're really trying to as open-minded as we can look at topics and hopefully explore them from a standpoint that'll um, be helpful to our listeners. So one of the things that we've talked a lot about is diet. And I think that might be one of the reasons that I keep bringing it up as a topic is I am always constantly trying to answer that question that I get asked all the time from patients, what is the perfect diet? And I think one of the things that we've realized and have uh, started to uh, figure out is that we're far from really knowing this answer and it might not be uh, the same answer for every person. Uh, But one of the things that I have really started to realize and that I really wanted to dive in is what is sort of the big fuss about, you know, there's three things I think that if you listen to a lot of different health providers uh, talk or, you know, you follow different people in the health world, there's sort of three that continue to come up. Uh, Do you want to guess what those are, Dad, even though I know you know the conversation for tonight? Well, you know, um, I would say in a preliminary sense that although we we do talk an awful lot about diet, if we if we look at the you know the when we we look at the field of what you mentioned as alternative medicine, but maybe even if we define that in terms of functional medicine, you know the the concepts that are are integral to functional medicine as a biologic based system um, is looking at diet as the, one of the foundational aspects of uh, of care. And so I, I think that this is an area that ha- there hasn't been enough emphasis in my mind in traditional medicine and, and I think is one of the pillars of of how you care for people. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, very important, um, area. And I think that's why it continues to, uh, uh, continues to come up. Well, I will actually piggyback off that because one of the reasons why I think it's such an important topic and one that I bring up a a lot and think that, you know, we need to have more conversations about it is even from an alternative world an alternative practice. So many times people are coming to me hoping that I will provide recommendations for supplements. You know, people are coming to you looking for recommendations for medicines and medications and they're coming to me for supplements. And I agree with you though. I think even in a general sense, we don't want to tackle the conversation of diet enough that it really isn't going to do us a lot of good to put you on a ton of medications or a ton of supplements. If we're not going to change that fundamental important part of what might be setting up some of the inflammation and different pathways, which is what you do every day, which is eat. And if you're eating the wrong foods, that is a huge thing that we have to sort of tackle and address. So, albeit not fun for people to address it. So, I think that um, you know there there are a couple of different aspects about the issue of diet, and I think that um, it probably is safe to say that there are there are certain um, there are certain things that everyone should limit uh, that it's probably quite uniform in terms of recommendations across the board that there are certain things in our, our, our Western diet, which uh, should be limited. I think the, the more complicated aspect of this, and I think this is evolving uh, with nutrigenomics is, um, is how individualized that diet should be. But I think uh, for the conversation this evening, I, I think that, um, uh, Megan, what you're kind of looking for is uh, a kind of a more higher view of this from a standpoint of some things that um, have, in some cases, been staples of our Western diet, uh, which are things that uh, are worth at least Mm re-examining. And uh, I know that there tends to be, even in the health and wellness world, 
what tend to be sort of popular diets, but, you know, whether I think a year ago, everybody was sort of starting the whole 30 diet, you know, when we talk about paleo diets, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, you know, some of the different diets that come up. I think one of the things that we see time and time again is there are three foods that get eliminated from these diets. And I think it's important to look at these foods and really dive into a good conversation of why. Uh, because I also think these are three foods that people are highly addicted to. And so those foods are gluten, dairy, and sugar. Uh, and I know the first one that I sort of want to tackle is dairy, and you were a little bit upset about that because, uh, go ahead and share why uh, dairy might be a little bit close and near, dear, near and dear to your heart. Well, uh, both of my uh, grandparents grew up on dairy farms, um, I currently am practice in central Wisconsin, and um, no matter where our viewers are in the United States, they probably, if they know anything about Wisconsin, identify it as a dairy state. So um, any talk about uh, dairy products uh, is, a, uh, is a sensitive topic um, in a state that is uh, so dependent upon um, it for its, um, its revenue. Well, and it's interesting, too, because one of the other things that I see time and time again when I do bring up the dairy uh, topic is that it's very polarized, that there are people that when you tell them to take out dairy, they immediately look at you like you're crazy. They're immediately worried that you are going to be hurting their bones, um, affecting their health. And almost always the question I get is, well, what about my bone health? What about my calcium? Which I think is interesting because really... Even though dairy um, and milk has calcium, it really is not a good source of calcium. We utilize it different when it comes in the milk source, and it actually robs our bones from, uh, or our calcium from bones because it is acid forming. And anything that's acid forming, calcium is a buffer. So for us to buffer it out through the kidneys, we have to actually leach out calcium to buffer it. So I think that, you know, it's interesting how we've sort of, tied, especially in past generations, dairy to good health, but it really isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I guess I have to admit, um, in a little bit different perspective about dairy, is that, uh, as you know, Megan, uh, on previous podcasts, we've, uh, we've talked a little bit about the history of food recommendations in the United States. And um, as embarrassing as it is to admit, uh, Oftentimes, those recommendations about what should be the staples of our diet um, were really more politically motivated than they were science or nutritionally motivated. And the uh, one of the culprits uh, certainly it was the dairy industry, uh, if not so much now, although I think it's still present now, certainly um, in earlier kind of recommendations that were made by our government in terms of uh, what should be the staples of our diet. Do you want to hear what I tell my patients just about that fact and that um, information? You're, you're supposed to say yes, I would like to hear. Well, I'm sitting down, so I guess I can, um, I'll can. i take okay. it whatever you're going to say. I just wanted to make sure you're excited for this. I always tell people the reason why you think you have to drink milk to have strong bones is the same reason why you feel you have to buy a diamond to tell somebody that you love them. It completely comes from the milk industry or the diamond industry that – the reason that we are that's so ingrained into our heads is just because the milk industry has done a wonderful job of you know got milk you need milk uh, you it's necessary in order to be strong and have strong bones when actually research shows just the opposite that the countries that drink the most milk actually have the highest rate of osteoporosis and bone uh, bad bone health so it's interesting but you know that is the culture we live in. And so you're suggesting to me even the the more recent commercials that are kind of the white mustache commercials or the uh, sports figures who who suggest that you have to drink chocolate milk um, that may be actually uh, deceptive advertising. It's really just revenue generating advertisement. And so that I think is really, you know, why so many people though are, um, feel like they can't let go of their milk 
But really, when we look at science, which we will right after these commercials, there's no science that really says that we should be drinking milk past, you know, uh, when we're weaned off from our mother. So we will talk more about that research and get into it in the next segment. So stick with us. You're listening to both sides of the prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment?, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, both sides of the prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. So, Megan, let's uh, do this now. Uh, give me your pitch against dairy. All of it in one little segment. Well, I actually do want to start out, though, with just a little bit of um, physiology because I think that this is important. And I think if people can grasp this, they can realize that I'm not just like a dairy hater, but there's a reason for it. Um, so, One of the major things is that when we really truly look at bone health, it's about preserving calcium. So it's not that in order to have proper bone health throughout life that we have to just keep giving and giving and giving calcium. Um, There's a lot of other things that go into bone health, you know, like uh, other parts of the bone matrix, vitamin D, those kind of things. But um, when we look at calcium itself and trying to preserve bones and teeth, which are calcium storage sites for us, What we want to do more than anything is not leach out and take that calcium from our bones. Uh, One of the things that we know is that any kind of diet that's more acidic in nature will cause us to take out that storage for calcium and to leach it out so that our kidneys can use it to buffer and to take away the acidity and make it more alkaline and neutralize it. Some of the things that make us more acidic are like high protein diets, um, high processed diets, things like that, that make us more acidic. But dairy itself, even though it does have calcium, they're not lying to you that it has calcium. We don't have as much bioavailable calcium in it. And then it also, uh, dairy itself makes our bodies form more acid. And then what happens is that actually leaches more of the um, alkaline calcium into our body. And that's where we get a lot of the osteoporosis and bone changes and bone health and those kind of things. So from a physiological standpoint, I think it's more important for us to realize that if we do want good bone health, we've got to look at our diet, take out, you know, the processed foods, the high, you know, high, high, you know, protein, um, without counteracting it with, you know, vegetables and other things that can help to alkalize. So I did want to state that first so that we can sort of have that physiology under our belt before we get into some of the other things that, you know, we know are negative about dairy. Did you have any questions, concerns, or comments before I move on? 
I uh, know. I you know. I and I think it is interesting that when you look at this um, on a higher level, for example, looking at uh, consumption of dairy products in countries, that actually the countries that have the highest consumption of dairy products uh, have the highest incidence of osteoporosis. Now, that may not necessarily mean that dairy products are the exclusive cause of the osteoporosis. Obviously, there could be a number of other factors that could play into that, mm -hmm. but um, it does. I think it does support the argument that um, some of this advertising uh, is, I think, in the perception that it gives uh, gives a listener is kind of false advertising. And I will say another concern that I've always had is that if people are just really concerned just about one aspect of bone health and calcium, and they're just taking large amounts of calcium every day. My sort of question and thought process is if you're not taking, you know, there are great comprehensive um, bone support for people, you know, who might be more at risk for bone fractures or bone um, deterioration or, um, you know, are in an age range where they want to really make sure that they're preserving their bones is that you need to make sure you're also taking vitamin D, which will help push it into the bones and other things. Because if you're just taking large amounts of calcium, you can't always then, um, make sure that you're not calcifying other areas of your body that you don't want calcified, even things like, you know, more at risk for kidney stones. Uh, and then, you know, obviously if we're calcifying, is that putting us at a risk for changes in blood vessels and things like that? So that's where I do think if you're going to utilize calcium for bone health, make sure you do it the right way and comprehensive. So that's the other thing that, you know, I think, uh, is important to talk about with patients and individuals who have concerns about bone health. So the point there is it's maybe more important to look at um, supplementing with vitamin D than it is necessarily with calcium. Mm -hmm. And to make sure your diet isn't leaching calcium from your bones and then to protect your bones with vitamin D. So that's the approach that I like to take on the majority of people and then to take, you know, different approaches than if there's other reasons to with testing and things like that. But I think we need to talk more about not leaching calcium from the bones through diet um, and lifestyle, uh, preserving the bones throughout life. You know, obviously, too, one of the conversations that always needs to be had is one of the best things you can do for your bones is weight bearing activity. So movement is a huge preserve um, preserver of bones. And so things like that, uh, are very beneficial. And then vitamin D, uh, does have benefits then to the bone, uh, uh, above what calcium can do. Now, now, oh, there are, go now ahead. There, we've talked a lot about calcium, but, um, that probably isn't the singular argument that you have against dairy. No, it is not my father. So one of the things that I think is important, no matter what we're talking about, and one of the things you probably will hear us talk about a lot is that you have to look at your source of food. And so, you know, when we talk about organic vegetables or we talk about meat or things like that, we're always talking about it's only as good as the source. And unfortunately, I think one of the reasons why we have to talk about dairy and a lot of these different diets take dairy out of the program is because unfortunately our source of dairy has become um, contaminated. And so there's a lot of conversations to be had about where this dairy is coming from. Um, so you're okay. talking about this in terms of the conditions in which the, the, the cows live with their exposure to um, their, their, their food source, um, the things that are done to the cows to um, affect their production of milk. That's kind of what you're talking about? Yes. So there's a couple different things that I think, you know, have to sort of be talked about because they will end up in the milk. So when the cow is uh, exposed to antibiotics, hormones, and pesticides, three things that cows are in our country are exposed to a lot, then those byproducts do end up in their bodily fluids, including their milk. And so, you know, when we look at hormones, which uh, cows are given a lot in order to plump them up faster in order to produce more milk. So obviously a cow that gets more hormones and more estrogen is going to produce more milk. Therefore, um, these hormones do end up again for us when we drink the milk. 
Uh, then if you look at the fact that cows are a lot of times raised in stressful environments, they're put in, you know, confined areas, their, their stress hormones are increased because they're living with very little room and eating a diet that is not their main diet or not their natural diet, I should say, you know, we give them a lot of corn and other things to beef them up and let them, you know, um, mature faster, get to puberty faster and produce milk faster. But those stress hormones are also going to end up in their milk. And so those are things to take into consideration, to think about, and to realize when you're drinking the glass of milk. And then the pesticides, because a lot of times, obviously, they are in an area where they're using pesticides on, you know, the grass or other places in the farm. And so they're also then getting the pesticides. So let me ask you, um, they now... I think you can go to almost any uh, grocery store and you can see that um, one of the options you have is organic milk. Mm -hmm. uh, would that eliminate some of the these things that you're indicating are arguments against milk? Well, it would take into consideration this component of the argument, but I do have another argument that would not have an effect on uh, no matter where you're getting the milk. And so when we look at the fact that you know, we want to make sure that the milk that we're getting or any food source that we're getting is as natural as possible and that there's not added things in there that we don't want. Uh, obviously, if you get a better source or if you're, you know, getting it from somebody who is uh, more humane to their cows and that cow is eating a more natural diet, you aren't getting maybe those negative effects that we just talked about. So you said there you had some other arguments. Um, is one of them um, the pasteurization process? Because I know that there's kind of this uh, subculture now, which is uh, which is suggesting that if you're going to drink milk, you should drink raw milk. Um, any comments about that? So we and I like this discussion too because this goes along with a lot of the other things about food, and so these are patterns and topics that we'll see in food. But the truth of the matter is, is that. We want food that is alive. We want food that'll rot. That's really an important thing is that there's a huge negative effect if I, if we're only eating, you know, Twinkies and other food that would never rot. Uh, and we always talk about the vitamins and minerals and, you know, talk about the, those things that are in food like milk and calcium. But we don't talk enough about enzymes and we don't talk enough about the things that'll make food rot. And the reason that it's important is because those enzymes, those bacteria, things like that have a huge positive effect on us. Our body needs those enzymes. And when the body doesn't get those enzymes, it can't not only break down the food the way that it should, but it also can't use those enzymes to repair and rejuvenate and to use them in different pathways. And so what happens during pasteurization is that we really kill off that active part of milk. So we kill off, you know, the bacteria. That's the reason we pasteurize is so that we can kill off the bacteria. But we also do it in at the expense of vitamins and minerals, um, different proteins and enzymes. And we want enzymes. We need enzymes in our diet. And so that's where I feel, you know, when we're looking at milk and we're looking at that pasteurization, it's a topic that we do have to have. And milk of today is not the same as milk of, you know, your grandparents that were milk farmers. They probably wouldn't even know what skim milk was. You know, what they used to process was, you know, this milk fat and it was cultured and it was raw and it had bacteria and it, it had enzymes. And that's much, much different than what we're finding in the grocery store today. So are you a proponent of raw milk then? I mean, could that be a solution? Yes, if you can find raw milk, it is better because then you are getting that uh, better quality and you are getting the enzymes and you are getting uh, the bacteria and things like that. Goat's milk is also um, the second, or I guess we're probably on third or fourth part. The other thing is that we're really not made to drink milk. We are, you know, and this is said a lot, we're the only mammal and the only animal that drinks another animal's milk that once we are weaned off, you know, milk, that we really shouldn't go back on it. That milk is perfect, you know, for babies. And then cow's milk is better, best for calves. And so it's not really made for us. So I think we should 
talk about this because I have some other things to add right after we take a commercial break. So stick with us. Uh, you're listening to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. Essential Nutrients LLC is the brainchild of entrepreneur Barbara Burns. Inspired by a desire to help others, Barbara worked with a team of scientists to develop unique nutritional liquid supplements with the goal to improve the quality of your life. Glucosamine, zinc, and calcium are essential to well-being, and this is the focus of Essential Nutrients LLC. Whether you're a professional athlete, weekend warrior, student, business owner, or homemaker, Essential Nutrients offers products for everyone, including the family pet. And they're easy to take, no pills. Health requires commitment, exercise, a good diet, proper supplementation, and action. So take action today and get your supply of essential liquid nutrients by visiting www.essential-liquids.com. Don't put off your health any longer. Take essential products today and start to measure the difference. Unleash the obstacles that bind you with certified professional coach Joanne Charette, a master practitioner in energy leadership. Joanne can help you break through personal and professional barriers and guide you to a higher level of empowerment and fulfillment. Passionate and dedicated, Joanne engages with her clients on a mutual journey. Her dynamic energy will motivate you to move forward as you partner on a venture to greater results. Isn't it time to make a breakthrough and commit to live the life you deserve? Invest in yourself and let Joanne Charette be the catalyst to the realization of your dreams by making them a reality. Based in Quebec, Canada, Joanne is also a space coach using social media and Skype to work with anyone anywhere around the world. Contact Joanne Charette today at 819-360-3266 or email her at actionrealization at live.ca 819-360-3266. Now is your time. Welcome back, everybody, to both sides of the prescription radio show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. So, Megan, we've kind of concentrated on milk. And uh, any any other um, parting comments uh, before we go on to the uh, the second um, the, yes the second dietary the, the the second thing that you would like to eliminate from diet. Yes. So, I do want to bring up two more things about dairy, um, and I'll make it sort of quick, but. Uh, one of the things that I think is important to you is, you know, what we were talking about before break, how really milk is that perfect food for a baby calf, just like, you know, human milk is best for a baby, um, that we're not really made to, um, drink milk. But what we're also finding is that, you know, maybe even about 75% of us genetically cannot properly digest milk after, you know, we are weaned, um, from our mother. So it's not even just the fact that, you know, it's not good for you because of all these things. A lot of us are not meant to continue to break or eat milk. We're made to, you know, eat normal food after we're done with milk at a young age. So in your practice, Megan, what you would, um, what you would recommend, I believe is that if someone wanted to explore if the way they were feeling might be due to, to dairy products is simply go through a process of eliminating from their diet and see, um, and if they do feel better, it would indicate that it, it may be a factor it may be an important factor for them to look at. If they don't feel any different, um, it may be that dairy products aren't necessarily as harmful to them as uh, as uh, we're sort of describing. And there's a couple of things you can do. If you're going to eliminate it, you have to eliminate it for at least six weeks. You'll usually notice a difference after about two, but you have to eliminate it for at least six to see is what I've, uh, is sort of the guideline. And there's some individuals, and that's the second part um, after in this segment that I wanted to talk about, is there is a certain group of people that I highly recommend to take out dairy. Um, and that group of people is anybody who has sort of constant phlegm, who's always clearing their throat or feels like phlegm is trapped in their throat. Uh, dairy is very mucus producing. And so that's why it's not great to take during a cold or if you're, you know, your immune system is fighting anything off is because dairy is very mucus producing and will cause um, you to produce more mucus and more phlegm. The other group is anybody with reproductive problems, any women, because our reproductive glands are very mucus producing too. And so a lot of times 
anybody, you know, whether it's PCOS and polycystic ovary syndrome or whether, you know, it's infertility or things like that, I always recommend that if we're doing anything um, hormonal uh, with women and there's any concerns with reproductive glands to also come off dairy so you're not producing more mucus. All right. So I had a little bit of advanced planning for tonight and I know that the second thing that you wanted to talk about was gluten. Now, you know, I think this is very interesting because if you look at you know, very recent governmental regula- uh, governmental guidelines for diet, uh, they really are grain product heavy. Um, mm-hmm. Current guidelines indicate that consumers should eat six to 11 servings of grain products, including at least three whole grain foods. Um, they recognize that uh, Americans fall short of this, but kind of this is, this is their recommendation. Uh, there are studies that are published which suggest that people who eat whole grain products actually have a decreased uh, rate of uh, death from all causes, but specifically heart disease and cancer. So um, this is uh, an area that um, carries some controversy uh, in terms of, um, you know, how do you fall on this particular issue? Well, I think that the important conversation to have is that not all grains are created equal. When we have a conversation, you will see a lot of benefits from whole grains. Um, I think one of the unfortunate things is that it's truly hard to find a true whole grain product anymore in the United States. And then, um, as we've talked about in the past, unfortunately, I think that we are changing a lot of our gluten to uh, have a lot of negative effects to it that can't not be talked about when we're talking about why gluten needs to be taken out because it's very inflammatory for certain people. But if we talk about the processing of grains, I think that that's sort of an important uh, reason why we will find really positive research about whole grains and, you know, the Mediterranean diet, which is considered one of the most healthy diets in the world really talks about whole grains. But when we look at how we process grains in our country, we tend to take out the good stuff. We tend to take out um, the fiber and the lignin part of it. And we tend to actually just take that part of the grain that doesn't have a beneficial effect. And then we do stuff to the grain itself that tends to maybe even have a deleterious effect to our health. So let me be clear about this is, It sounds to me as if there may be a sort of advertisement whole grain, meaning something that uh, people may indicate is part of their um, cereal, for example, but you would really question whether or not that is uh, truthfully a whole grain um, as you might want to put into a diet like a Mediterranean diet to make it a a, a more healthy diet. Yes, because you can say it's whole grain, but then you can change it. And that's, again, you know, this is interesting because it is sort of a piggyback onto the conversation that we just had is one of the reasons why I think we have to talk about this so much in our country is unfortunately, I think what's best for our health is unfortunately not what's best for our food makers. And uh, one of the examples of this is the fact that When we look at a lot of foods that are good, like high fiber foods, or we look at, you know, really whole foods or foods in their pure form, they don't have high shelf life. And, you know, that's great for us. You know, it's great if we're going to eat all from a farmer's market. And if you eat from a farmer's market, you're probably going to have to go once or twice a week to replenish because that food doesn't last for very long. But unfortunately, you know, and people will say this too, that's a huge burden to the person and it's a huge burden to the food industry. So whether or not they're trying to look at a grain or they're trying to look at making an apple last longer, they have to make changes to that natural form. And uh, what we're finding is that a lot of the times we have to highly process a grain in order to increase its shelf life, which takes away the positive effects that we see from a true whole grain product. And we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, it is really with the industrial revolution, we changed how we milled and changed the grains. And that's what, you know, completely sort of changed the effect then that this had on our health and wellness and why now a lot of diets take out 
gluten and a lot of grains? So, um, I know that what you want, what what you were speaking about, was the harm in gluten, and we've we've sort of transitioned over to the really interesting question of of what do we mean by a, a whole grain? Um, it does sound to me as if if you were in fact able to find something that meets your strict definition of whole grain, uh, you would accept that it it could be part of a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if you can find um, a grain that is truly a whole grain and then you don't have a problem with gluten, um, celiac disease or uh, anything like that, then uh, that would be a very positive for most people. That would be a very positive thing for them to eat. So let me ask you, uh, when you when you advise your How do you tell, uh, what do you tell them? Uh, how, how can they, uh, how can they assure themselves that they're getting uh, the best? Well, I think one of the important things um, whenever you're looking at this and to really take it into consideration is that when you're looking at where it's coming from is the more that you know the source of the food, the better off it's going to be. So I think it's really important to uh, know exactly where that is coming from. Unfortunately, one of the things that you sort of have to take uh, with a grain of salt and to really realize is that when we look at the different grains and we look at the different uh, food options out there when it comes to grains and gluten and things like that, is that the more well-known the brand is, usually the more milled it is, the more that it is uh, not going to be something that is beneficial to your health. Uh, unfortunately, a general rule in health and wellness is that the more popular something is, the more you have to do your research on it. And this is across the board. And, you know, I talk about this a lot with my patients. Unfortunately, whether it comes to a food item or whether it comes to a supplement or whether it comes to a health fad, the more that everybody knows about it, the more there's going to be companies that are going to try to cut corners and get in on that fad. And so this is really important, you know, when it comes to the food sources um, and with gluten and grains that, you know, if you can find them from a local shop or if you can find a local source or if you can find uh, a farmer's market that does their own bread, that tends to be a little bit better. Um, and then you really do a lot of times have to do your own research. Many times, if you don't know whether or not you're having a problem, though, it's that same basic idea is a good approach to take out gluten, take out the grains, uh, and then after you've had them out for about six weeks, to bring them back and see how you do with them, and then to start with more pure forms. The other question that gets asked a lot is then what's the difference between sprouted grains whole grains and then just grains in general. And I think that's really important conversation because sprouted grains are still going to have, you know, like the gluten. So if you're gluten sensitive or celiac disease, then you can't have sprouted grains, but the soaking process of the sprouted grains actually make it more di digestible and they make it so that it's less robbing to your body of vitamins and minerals. They take out something called, um, the, um, uh, uh, phthalates that will actually then, uh, those will go and, uh, make it so you can absorb your vitamins and minerals as well. So by taking those out, then you've made a more, uh, nutrient dense grain, um, which has a lot of health benefits. So if you're going to eat grains and you know that you can handle gluten, then I would recommend to really find either a whole grain source and a true one, not just one that, you know, says it is, um, but, you know, then you look and it's bleached bread uh, or that they've added a bunch of coloring back to it or that you're finding a good sprouted grain bread. So this is interesting uh, because, um, you know, I, I think one thing I, I'm hearing you say is that um, uh, if you are going to eat uh, grains, you should eat whole grains and you need to be careful in terms of, um, of what that actually means. Uh, I, I, 
and uh, maybe we can finish up the, the evening by talking about that a little more and getting a little bit into the gluten sensitivity and probably make this a, a two-hour show in terms of um, of some of the things that we want to get to because obviously these areas are pretty complex. Yep. No. And I definitely think it's important for everybody. So I'm glad we're not going to rush the conversation, but instead to talk about the things that people need to know as they're making these dietary changes and the reasons to do it. So stick with, stick with us. We're going to break one more time for commercial, but we'll be back and we hope you are too. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daily Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Welcome back, everybody, to Both Sides of the Prescription radio show on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. So, Megan, we um, we spent a significant amount of time talking about dairy, and we've gotten a, a little bit into a second area that you are pretty passionate about, and that is uh, gluten sensitivity. Uh, but we've uh, talked about it in terms of just one angle, and that angle is um, kind of looking at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration the Food and Drug Administration recommendations uh, for grains and and looking at if you are going to eat whole grains, uh, one of the, some of the things that you should look for. Um, and I think I think these points are um, are really important. And um, I think that one of the things that I would imagine might be difficult for you, but I'm seeing is more and more difficult is that in the United States, for example, if I have someone come up to me and indicate, you know, what kind of a diet should I eat uh, having been diagnosed with cancer and I want to give them some options and I, for example, might indicate, well, you know, there's there's in information to suggest the health benefit of a Mediterranean diet. Um, it may be hard for them to really replicate a Mediterranean diet uh, going into the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, I think that's an important concept too, is that we talk a lot of times about these perfect diets or, you know, these guidelines like the Mediterranean diet or the paleo diet or whatnot. And an important thing to realize is that the Mediterranean diet is great to take rules from. It's great to take some guidance from, but we're not going to eat the same way as the Mediterranean because we're just not going to have really those true resources that the Mediterranean does, which is their environment and ability to get that food fresh. So, you know, I think that it's important to realize that even though we're giving the guidelines of, you know, doing a Mediterranean diet and those guidelines with the high fats and the good fats and the oils and stuff is true, that we also have to realize that the fats are going to be a little bit different because of the location. And so, but with that, to take those guidelines of good, healthy fats, you know, are beneficial, 
you know, whole grains and fiber and things like that are beneficial. Um, and then eating a diet that's low in processed food. It's not just what's in the diet that's important, but what's not in the diet too that needs to be a part of the conversation. Well, I think that that's, um, I think that's a really good point. And um, probably if you're talking about remodeling your diet, um, the the initial work you do on remodeling it is probably should be more in the lines of what you should not have in it rather than some of these refinements that we're talking about which ultimately in a in a more ideal diet would be part of it well and i know we talked about this just a couple shows ago but i can't say this enough just from clinical practice that so many times the foods that we're eating and the foods that we want is not to feed our body it's to feed our cravings and that it's actually addictions that's driving us day to day. And this is evident by the fact that diet's different than everything else where, you know, you can sometimes say to the person, you know, if it feels good, it's good for you. You know, if you're exercising and you start to feel good, it's good for you. Diet's completely different. If we go off of just our basic diet of what makes us feel good, we'll be eating foods that we're addicted to and that we're, you know, craving versus the foods that are really feeding us. And with that being said, a lot of times the foods that we first have to take out are the foods that we're addicted to, the foods that are going to seem the hardest to take out. You know, if you feel like you're going from, you know, one glass of milk to the other or just, you know, have to have cheese on everything, it's probably not because that dairy's feeding your body, but probably because of the fact that it's having an effect on your brain and your body and you're addicted to it. Yeah. And, um, you know, there've been some classic examples, I think of, um, of, of that very fact that are, are pretty obvious. I mean, um, supersize me, uh, which is now several years old, I think spoke specifically to that uh, to that issue of whether food um, becomes an addiction or a craving, as you said, rather than um, food that uh, that feeds us and makes us well. And we know that what these foods do is they actually bind to the receptors in the brain the same as drugs and morphine and heroin. And so they become extremely addictive. And, you know, the foods that probably have the biggest effect on the brain and become most addicting is dairy, wheat, and sugar. And so a lot of times the reason we have to take it out is because a lot of people honestly have more of an addiction than a desire to eat it for fuel. Well, I, I think it's an important point to, to make in the hour uh, that when when we're talking about these foods and we're talking about them from a m number of different levels, but um, I think that uh, this is an issue that has to be, you know, that has to be recognized uh, as uh, an important issue in terms of kind of your long-term approach towards food. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I think it's really important because even though it's really hard to do that, what I always tell people is it's going to be sort of that same thing because it is these, you know, casomorphins and uh, dairy part of the, um, or the casein part of the dairy that is binding to your brain, but it's just like anything else. It's that first three days, the 72 hours, that's the hardest. And it's the first two weeks that really makes sure that you're no longer addicted to it. So, you know, I always tell people try it for two weeks and you're going to be shocked the difference. And it might be a hard two weeks and especially a hard first couple of days. But the truth of the matter is, is you'll feel way different afterwards. So Megan, I think we could, we could probably say that, um, we have so much more, I think, that we need to talk about that is important with regard to gluten sensitivity and sugar that um, it would not do it justice for us to try to approach it this evening. And I think maybe at this point, um, maybe just a few more comments or a summary about kind of what we went over this, this uh, evening. Uh, you know, I think that it's important that we always sort of put it put into perspective why we talk about diet as much as we do. And, uh, and I think that just as in traditional medicine, and I say this somewhat unfortunately, uh, we, we, our base for our recommendations is often medications, uh, some of them very, very helpful, but obviously uh, with issues. 
if we look at something like functional medicine, we really are looking at the foundation of that is diet. So diet has to be something that's kind of forefront in, in how we manage uh, people's health. Um, we picked a kind of a sensitive issue for somebody who uh, works in Wisconsin, but we spent a, lo- a large part of the of the hour on on dairy. Uh, I think there were some really important points that that we made that you made. Uh, one of them being um, the falsehood that drinking milk necessarily is good for your bones. Uh, you made that I think fairly clear with regard to the the fact that dairy products when they're metabolized are acid forming and to neutralize that uh, our body actually uses alkaline calcium that's stored in the bones so that um, it's actually more more likely in heavy dairy product consumers that they may have to fight osteoporosis more than normal that if we are going to talk about our bones it's more important to talk about movement and vitamin d Uh, we also spent you spent a fair amount of time uh, warning us about how dairy cows are are handled, um, how they're processed, how they're exposed to antibiotics, hormones, pesticides. Um, And then we talked about organic milk, we talked about raw milk, we talked about goat's milk, we talked a little bit about uh, almond milk. Um, You brought out the fact that um, the pasteurization process is uh, felt to be necessary for some purposes, but one of the unfortunate things about that is it destroys some of the things that are essential to the benefit of any food, such as vitamins, proteins, enzymes, and particularly with regard to enzymes, it's very destructive. Uh, You cautioned us regarding um, the fact that 75% of of Americans uh, may lack the enzymes to digest milk as adults, but you were you're indicated in your own clinical practice that the things that that you look at most are people that have uh, seasonal allergies or reproductive problems. So I thought that discussion was uh, very interesting, and we just sort of got in to the issue of gluten by talking about whole grains and um, more about that next week. Yeah, I think we have a great place to pick up next week. So I hope everybody joins us as we continue this conversation. And thanks for listening to Both Sides of the Prescription on BBM Global and Tune In Radio. You've been listening to Both Sides of the Prescription with your host, Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron. So many times, people are only given one side of the healthcare story. Here, you get both sides. Tune in next week as we discover Dr. Megan and Dr. Ron's Both Sides of the Prescription. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.